these are, these are the East African mountains. And it so happens that the movement occurs across the equator in this part. Uh, and there are explanations, but you can see how, uh, how it occurs like a jet. Uh, this is, these are the East African mountains and the flow hugs the, uh, hugs the mountain. This was pointed out sometime in uh, late 70s, first by I think later, later on by Hart et al. The reason why it happens in this fashion was given by David Anderson. Any passage of a fluid parcel from south of the equator to the north of the equator means uh, it has to change its potential vorticity, a conserved quantity. You can't do that unless you have a dissipative mechanism. In order to create that dissipative mechanism, it hugs the western side, uh, it hugs the uh, East African mountains. It finds the East African mountains there. And that is where something equivalent to what happens in the oceans, the Gulf Stream hugs the western part of the Atlantic Ocean. The Kuroshio hugs the western part of the Pacific. A similar thing happens by the jet, now called the Finlater jet, hugging the wall against which a frictional layer can exist. So that is the mechanism by which that jet gets created. You can see that in the month of March, before the onset of the monsoon, or something similar to the monsoon, uh, you have winds coming from the northeast. That is the winter monsoon. In July, that picture has completely changed. We have a jet-like flow sticking off the coast of Africa, which then turns and flows south and goes again. And this, again, these data were based on a quick scat, uh, another sensor of the satellite, uh, which uh, uh, gives you winds over the ocean, but not over the over the land area. Uh, a few months later, you have this situation where the northeast monsoon has set, uh, set again, and you have the winds coming from the northeast. So the most interesting thing is that we have this kind of a flow which has been set up because this area becomes active and uh, supports ascent of uh, uh, air masses. Now, so what does it do to the ocean? Uh, in order to do that, I will talk a little bit about the ocean. What is plotted here is how a typical ocean temperature, salinity, and density looks. If I, oceans are on an average, on average about uh, four kilometers, but I've plotted just the top 1,000 meters, it's 250 meters have been enlarged Typically, temperature just keeps decreasing as you go southward. Salinity, this is a picture in the typical picture in the Arabian Sea. Salinity doesn't do much. It, uh, it, it does not contribute all that much to density. And the density increases, thereby creating a stable water column in the Arabian Sea. Now, winds acting on such a water column can change the sea surface temperature, and it does so by two means. One is mix the surface layer. So if you mix the top 50 meters or so, it's going to cool the sea surface temperature. But it can also do some other things, like push up the deeper waters towards the surface, and I'll show you how that can happen. And by doing so, it can increase the lowering capacity of the winds, uh, uh, a process which is often called upwelling. And coastal divergence can lead to coastal upwelling or any other divergence of, uh, uh, of uh, surface layers can do the same thing. How does that happen? Now let us say we have a jet, something like the Finlater jet in coastal area. We are in the northern hemisphere, so it's going to push because of the Coriolis effect, 
it is going to push the water towards the right, something which is shown here. If you push the water towards the right, then deeper layers have to come towards the surface. Then the wind mixes it, and that is how the surface temperature cools. If you have a jet, a very strong flow, the cooling is more intense. And in fact, off uh, uh, Somalia, uh, is off east coast of Africa, that, that upwelling is one of the most intense that happens anywhere in the world oceans. So we have, again, a very special feature of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the ocean in this part. Uh, if uh, you can also produce upwelling in, uh, uh, in an open jet-like flow, like what happens. Imagine I have winds, uh, uh, something like this, a situation which occurs in the Northern Arabian Sea. If you have a situation like this, then this will produce, will push much more, uh, uh, much more uh, water mass towards the right, in this case towards the south, than what this arrow will do. And you, because of that convergence, uh, because of that divergence of water mass, water from the deeper layers has to come up, again inducing cooling of the surface layers. So we have uh, situations whereby uh, both these situations occur in the Arabian Sea. And what you have is uh, a situation that arises in the month of May. Uh, the whole of the Arabian, uh, Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, have temperatures which are of the order of 30s uh, or well about 28 degrees. But two months later, two months later, the entire uh, the Western Arabian Sea uh, gets cooled down to something like uh, less than 26 degrees. Okay. Now I had earlier told you that uh, there is a rule uh, which was uh, empirically determined unless the sea surface temperature exceeds about 27 degrees or so, uh, you cannot support ITCZ. Okay? So in this part then, the ITCZ must break and it is breaking because the sea surface temperatures have cooled to a level where they cannot support the ITCZ. Okay? Uh, Conditions that need to be satisfied for rainfall to occur over the North Indian Ocean, ITCZ should have moved over the region, which is something which happens during the four months that we are talking about, and sea surface temperature uh, should exist a critical value of what, 27.5 or 28 degrees. And uh, that, uh, uh, now in the month of April, it does happen. Uh, it, uh, you do have a continuous ITCZ as it moves uh, northward, but by, uh, May, uh, by June, that hole has appeared because the sea surface temperature has cooled. That hole widens as uh, it uh, cools further, and uh, you, that is how that hole that I pointed out to you, notice that it is the only hole in the ITCZ in the entire globe. It's a very special region. And it has happened because first, the atmosphere has acted by producing uplift of air over the uh, Bay of Bengal. That has produced a jet-like flow across the East African mountains, which to which the ocean has responded by cooling the surface, which has destroyed the ITCZ. In other words, this is a classic case of atmosphere-ocean interaction. Something happens in the atmosphere. The ocean that responds to it in a fashion which uh, does something to the atmosphere. So uh, I want to give this as an example by which the atmosphere-ocean coupling is producing this characteristic, which does not occur anywhere else in the world oceans, uh, or in the ITCZ as well as the world oceans. So what we have, that is the break in precipitation belt over the Western Arabian Sea, is because of the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere. There is atmospheric convection. It produces a Findlater jet. There is cooling of the Arabian Sea, both in the west as well as in the northern parts, which 
leads to suppression of convection and breakdown of the ITCC. Okay? Now, in contrast to what happens in the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal stays significantly warmer during the Indian summer monsoon. In the Arabian Sea, the winds associated with the summer monsoon are stronger because that is where the jet turns. That is where the jet forms. As by the time it goes, reaches the Bay of Bengal, those winds weaken quite a bit. So the winds are weaker over the Bay of Bengal. At the same time, uh, uh, there is, uh, there is because of the uh, because of the weaker winds, the oceanic circulation is weaker. It is uh, sluggish, and it cannot transfer much heat to the deeper layer. But there is another very important reason why the Bay of Bengal uh, behaves quite differently from the Arabian Sea. And that is because there is a very strong near surface stratification because of low salinity in the Bay of Bengal. And let me give you an example. This was the earlier distribution of vertical distribution of temperature, salinity, and density. Almost at the same latitude, but in the Bay of Bengal, you see a situation where sea surface temperature does this, but most importantly, salinity drops to values which are something like 31 parts per thousand, something unheard of in mostly in the most of the oceans, but uh, particularly unheard of in the, Arab in, in the Arabian Sea. So what has happened is, because there is a lot of fresh water flow into the Bay of Bengal, it produces a stratified area in a large density structure, which the oceans, which the weaker winds of the Bay of Bengal can't mix. So we have a situation whereby Bay of Bengal can retain surface uh, higher temperatures simply because there is a well-stratified region. And so why, why does, uh, why does uh, uh, Bay of Bengal get uh, so much of, and from where does it get uh, fresh water? If you look at the geometry of the Indian subcontinent, you will notice that here the, the height as you move from the western part towards the eastern part, it rises, what we call the western guards, and then it tapers down, it slopes down towards the Bay of Bengal from there on, as a result of which all our bigger rivers uh, debouch uh, their fresh water in the Bay of Bengal. So this is a consequence uh, of, uh, uh, of the geometry of the subcontinent. Uh, they slope, the subcontinent slope downwards to the Bay of Bengal. On the west coast, therefore, we have, even though this is a high precipitation region, uh, we have rivers which are usually a few tens of kilometers long. Here they go in uh, a large number of kilometers, thousand kilometers or so. So this is the difference between the rivers of the east, uh, of the west coast with the rivers of the east coast. They very often form deltas. And they, they bring their fresh water to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the uh, Bay of Bengal. As a result of which, if you look at the surface salinity in the Bay of Bengal, uh, it is markedly different of the order of 30, 31 or so than what happens in the Bay of Bengal. This is the surface salinity in the Bay of Bengal, or salt content in the, uh, in the world oceans. You see a distinct difference between these two basins, even though these two basins are sitting on the two sides of our country. It's a part of the North Indian Ocean. And it is this freshening of the surface layer which helps in retaining, uh, uh, in retaining uh, 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 heat. Uh, retaining higher temperatures to sustain the ITCC and make it one of the most active uh, parts of the entire global ITCC. In the Arabian Sea, on the other hand, uh, over a year, it uh, loses about a meter of water to evaporation, 
because there, there is hardly any precipitation and evaporation uh, is uh, uh, quite significant. The Bay of Bengal, on the other hand, gains more than a meter of fresh water because precipitation and runoff exceeds evaporation. It gains about a meter, uh, a meter and a half. Uh, so what we have is a shallow surface mix layer that is stable and responds quickly to changes in the atmosphere. Uh, implication is sea surface temperature in the Bay of Bengal remains higher than about 28 degrees centigrade throughout the summer monsoon, supporting a large scale deep convection. The atmospheric heating associated with the convection helps in sustaining the monsoon winds and the rainfall associated with it, not only over the bay, but over other parts of the Indian subcontinent, and it maintains a low surface salinity. So uh, what we have So we have quite a, 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 a contrasting situation between what happens over the Arabian Sea versus what happens in the Bay of Bengal. We have a shallow surface layer that is stable. In the Arabian Sea, we have a strong overturning, which uh, leads to lower SSTs, weak convective activity, which in turn leads to low rainfall and runoff, resulting in a weak stratification, which can be cooled easily. It is does in both basins there is a cycle of a positive feedback, one acting in a direction opposite to that of the other. And this was uh, pointed out quite some time ago that uh, the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal uh, have feedbacks acting in opposite direction, one producing a cold region or cooler region than, uh, uh, and the other producing a warm region. The warm region supports convective activity, the cool region uh, suppresses it. And that is why you have that uh, uh, tremendous difference between the convective activity over the Arabian Sea versus the Bay of Bengal. Now, uh, I had also pointed out to you that uh, there seems to be something happening over the Bay of Bengal that pushes, that uh, produces rainfall over the tropics. And the way that happens uh, most of the time is this warm Bay of Bengal uh, breeds uh, depressions. Uh, the ITCC is supposed to have depressions, as I pointed out earlier. So it breeds uh, depressions. Most of them come from this part of the region. As these depressions move, uh, you get precipitation in, in their path. You might have noticed uh, that uh, the weatherman on the television often says there is a depression brewing in the Bay of Bengal, so we can expect uh, rainfall. The, this is the mechanism, how it happens. Uh, you form a depression, and uh, again, uh, due to geophysical constraints, uh, dynamical constraints, they have a tendency to move towards the northwest or the west. That is how you get precipitation to northwest or west or where uh, these uh, 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 these uh, depressions are bred. If you look at uh, the number of depressions uh, that uh, empirically, again, uh, that have formed over the Bay of Bengal over a, a large uh, period, uh, you find that the northern Bay of Bengal, uh, the region where the Brahmaputra and uh, Ganga uh, uh, release their fresh water is the region uh, where uh, these uh, uh, depressions form the most. Uh, so now, going back to the picture that uh, we have seen, uh, notice that the centers of precipitation that are most prominent uh, here, 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 and here, they all lie on the windward side of topographic slope. And uh, which suggests that it has something to do with either uplift or due to some other mechanism, which may be more complicated, like, for example, in the Arakan areas. Uh, apparently, uh, systems form offshore, and then they get pushed, then they uh, move onto the slope. And as it moves onto the slope, those systems precipitate. 
And that is how you get large precipitation. Maybe something of that kind happens along the west uh, coast also, and along, uh, the, uh, 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 along the foothills of the Himalayas. So we have that situation. Uh, you also notice that there is a, a decrease in uh, rainfall uh, along this line, and this line happens to be uh, 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 the line along which the monsoon current moves, uh, which carries uh, the cooler waters of the Arabian Sea into the warmer waters of the Bay of Bengal. So along the line uh, that it uh, uh, takes, uh, you have a decreased precipitation, which separates the in higher intensity uh, near the equator from what happens into the Bay of Bengal. So again, you, you see uh, sea surface temperature uh, influencing uh, the, the, the amount of precipitation which takes place. Uh, a few years ago, uh, sometime in 2010, uh, uh, it was pointed out by Booz and Kuang that the Himalayan mountains, that is these, uh, the, the high mountains, uh, form a barrier which prevent the cooler water masses of uh, uh, cooler air masses of the northern latitudes from coming into our region and thereby cooling things. So it is uh, not the heating of the land, but just the barrier which is formed uh, uh, formed uh, by the Himalayan mountains uh, that has a bigger impact on uh, what uh, uh, what the mountains do uh, to uh, the Himalayas. And this picture was taken uh, by uh, a comment uh, by Mark Kane on that particular article. So in the ITCC over the Pacific and the Atlantic, the following coincide. We have a salinity maximum, uh, a SST maximum, precipitation maximum, and the wind velocity minimum, which uh, justifies the name, they are doldrums. In the North Indian Ocean, which has gone through a modification of the ITCZ after it moves into the uh, North Indian Ocean. While the SST maximum over the Bay of Bengal does coincide with precip precipitation maximum, the region of velocity uh, minimum is closer to the equator because you have that jet turning towards the east and going over the region. So uh, it doesn't quite justify the word doldrums as far as uh, the Bay of Bengal is concerned. So this is one of the modification which takes place uh, uh, in the ITCZ after it moves over our region. Uh, this is just a picture to show you the wind speed. The wind speed over the Bay of Bengal is quite large. It is uh, lower uh, uh, near the equator, and that is where that ITCZ part uh, which had a little higher precipitation, six. So all these modifications occur uh, in, in, uh, once the ITCZ moves over the Indian Ocean. Now, I don't want to give you the feeling that everything is hunky-dory as far as uh, the, uh, uh, our in understanding of the systems, uh, understanding of the distribution of precipitation over the North Indian Ocean is concerned. As a matter of fact, there is a hole that sits here, just to the east of uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, th there is, as of now, uh, no uh, good explanation as to why it sits there. There are a couple of theories which have been proposed. And uh, one of them is that it is probably uh, due to, uh, due to uh, topographic effect uh, in the region uh, of just to the west of it, or some have said that it may be because of the cooling that happens uh, due to the arrival of the water from uh, uh, Arabian Sea into the Bay of Bengal. That problem is still unsolved at the moment. Uh, one reason why uh, uh, progress has not been rapid is the state of the art global general circulation models uh, or coupled models that have both the uh, ocean and the atmosphere in them have problems in getting the precipitation right. So
so uh, they, they don't quite reproduce what the observations say. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the major problems uh, that uh, we will need to confront in order to uh, understand the monsoon uh, better. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the monsoons are linked to a planetary scale phenomenon that leads to the formation of the intertropical convergence zone. Over half the year, we experience the trades uh, with the ITCZ well to the south of the Indian Peninsula. That is our winter monsoon, uh, when we, uh, that is our dry season. In the Indian summer monsoon, which is the four months approximately, June to September, with May and October acting as transition, uh, sets in when the ITCZ migrates to the north with the sun, but with uh, a migration rate which is dramatically different from what happens uh, elsewhere uh, in the ITCZ. It leads to convergence of moisture, high humidity over the Indian Ocean and the surroundings. It also, the migration is accompanied by local modification. As I explained to you, uh, the ITCZ virtually disappears over the Arabian Sea, but it intensifies over the Bay of Bengal. Uh, Notice that land topography has played a role in these modifications. Uh, notice that the East African mountains help in formation of the Finlater jet, which is so essential to induce that coastal upwelling. Topography of the Indian Peninsula helps to keep the Bay of Bengal fresher and warmer, thereby making it capable of sustaining warmer uh, sea surface temperature. Himalayas block the northern uh, uh, cooler, drier air from reaching the Indian Ocean Peninsula and the surrounding North Indian Ocean. Major centers of pre precipitation occur on the windward side of Western Ghats, the Arakans, and the foothills of Himalaya. So uh, what you are seeing here is the atmosphere-ocean interaction taking place in the presence of special features of the topography of this region. Because of this rather special uh, environment, uh, 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 the special uh, topography of the region, the geometry of the two seas, and so on, uh, we have uh, uh, local factors uh, that uh, make the Indian uh, monsoon, uh, that migration of the ITCZ, quite unique. Uh, we don't have a similar situation arising elsewhere. No other part of the tropics has anything quite like it, uh, and that is what makes the monsoon uh, such an uh, interesting as well as intriguing uh, phenomenon to study. Thank you uh, for your attention. This is absolutely amazing. I'm sure a lot of people always uh, had the question in their mind, why is India so special that it has a monsoon and nobody else does? Why does it come from the Arabian Sea? And we learned a lot today. Uh, uh, Professor Shetier can take questions. Uh, if there are, there are traveling mics around in the auditorium. And uh, uh, I don't know, please raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, I was wondering whether global warming has any effect on ITCZ, because uh, SST would probably have some interaction with that. Uh, I'm not a specialist. As, I, uh, as you know, I'm a physical oceanographer. It's a question which is meant for meteorologists. But uh, I understand it does have an impact. It's going to change. The, first of all, uh, see, the uh, monsoon has uh, uh, implications which are uh, derived from the large-scale circulation. It's the whole Hadley cell. And as uh, the atmosphere warms, you expect uh, to have an impact on the large-scale circulation. Already, there are claims that other thing which it does is not so much about the mean circulation, but it increases the possibility of uh, extreme events, uh, like uh, floods, 
and uh, droughts. And uh, th there are claims that uh, you are already seeing that happen. So yes, I think the monsoons uh, will uh, have that. Uh, it's difficult, but uh, whenever you uh, see an extreme uh, precipitation event happen, uh, you tend to think, is this one of the consequences of the warm uh, warming of the atmosphere? should also note that today uh, in our audience we have Professor Shulochana Gadgil, who is of course, whose work was featured quite a lot in this, uh, 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 in, in this talk. I don't know whether you had a comment. I just wanted to respond to the question okay. because about the SST threshold, it is very interesting that all the models show that as the global warming occurs, in fact, if SST increases, the threshold shifts so in the final analysis, the convection doesn't change. The entire pattern of SST convection relationship shifts. So on a warmer SST, you would have a, sh have a shift to 28.5, for example. OK? And therefore, eventually, you will get the same, same rain over the ocean. But uh, what Professor Shetty said is right, that uh, you know the extreme events are likely to increase. But otherwise, the models that we have Today, state-of-the-art cu coupled models are so bad in simulating the monsoon and its observed climate variability now that it is really, you have to take what they say about what happens to the monsoon with a large pinch of salt. <laughs> I'm glad to know it's still not an exact science. We'll all be out of business. As Madam mentioned, pinch of salt, my question is related to salt, and there are two of them. One is the global warming in, in, uh, has an impact also on the sea, uh, sea salinity levels. So is there any study which points out towards impact on monsoon due to changes in sea salinity that is connected with global warming? Second question is, if the discharge of rivers which are reducing the salinity in Bay of Bengal is affected by mega projects of diverting water river waters or hydroelectric dams I, is is there a significant impact of these mega projects or or these are just you know we are just pulling out buckets from oceans okay uh, uh, you have two questions which are uh, quite different kinds of questions uh, the first question is as global uh, warming sets in what will happen to the salinity and i think it uh, it's uh, the referees are still out on that uh, it is, uh, uh, salinity is very strongly controlled by the amount of precipitation that occurs. So it all depends on how the precipitation is going to change and how these extreme events, which I uh, mentioned to you, are uh, going to further uh, change things. So about that, we don't have a very good idea. About your second question, as you start damming the rivers, are you going to change the environment? There is a, re a real concern on that. And I th there are claims that uh, in the Amazon, you are already seeing the impact of that. And I, I think this is an issue which we need to, uh, uh, which we need to take uh, very seriously. Uh, we need to know uh, how safe is it to prevent uh, water uh, from entering the oceans to sustain the kind of stable environment that we are used to at the moment. If you change that, how will things change is, uh, is still an open question. And as was pointed out by uh, Professor Gargil, uh, we are not producing the right kind of uh, pictures of precipitation uh, with our models right now. And that is the big challenge uh, to make at the moment. Uh, yeah. Shiva. Uh, okay, so one part I didn't understand is that why uh, there's a region of this uh, lack of rain near Sri Lanka, right? Mm -hmm. So why can't we just say it's because of the topology of the region? Uh, well, I would be confident of that if we had a good model which reproduces that hole uh, when you have the real topography and the hole disappears when you remove the topography, something which we can do with models. So at the moment, 
the trouble about carrying out experiments of that kind is we are not even getting the present situation right. So experimenting with it becomes difficult. But there have been suggestions uh, by using hand-waving arguments that uh, you could actually get that old uh, by uh, topographic uh, influence. Okay, I had uh, one more question, which is a bit off topic. Okay. So um, they have these images of salinity of uh, the sea and the oceans around us, mm. uh, which is of course using satellites. So uh, how uh, e uh, exactly is the mechanism of these sal satellites that uh, help detect the salinity of the water? Uh, Salinity of the water is not easy to measure, and it's only recently that a satellite has been launched in order to measure the salinity. Uh, I think we need to uh, look at the data closely to say how reliable that is. The pictures which I showed you of salinity were not based on satellite data. They were based on in situ observations. So my question is regarding like uh, as the first two questions were regarding global warming. So I would like to uh, inform that uh, uh, there are, it is about twenty billion dollars of loss uh, Earth is uh, I mean, here as a mankind we are facing due to global warming. So uh, now present scenario is like we are warming the atmosphere through carbon dioxide. And another thing is that in future we are in India we are thinking about uh, damming the rivers. So this is we are artificially modeling the atmosphere, or at artificially ch uh, bringing the change in the atmosphere. So if there, uh, so it, its consequences would be hazardous. Means, so can we not uh, uh, use the physics of nanoparticles or nanotechnology, what we say, to control the adverse effects or had hazardous effects of the uh, carbon dioxide or uh, damming of rivers or uh, anything other than that? Uh, is there any okay, study, okay. Uh, study yes, which uh, uh, says I that I nanoparticles would c control the atmosphere? Well, uh, I'm, not sh I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, so what um, release of nanoparticles in the, uh, in the environment will do, will do uh, something is, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, maybe something we should uh, think about. We can have a yeah. couple more questions, but please stay on the topic, uh, question, on, on the topic question. that was oh, talked about. One question. Yeah. Uh, like uh, uh, the uh, moon's orbit around the Earth and control the oceans high tide, low tide. Mm -hmm. So, if there is some ch change, artificial change, if due to some any other reason or due to comet or any other plastic on the moon's surface, if moon's uh, orbit uh, comes nearer to the Earth or goes away from the Earth, so what sort of changes we can see in the atmosphere, or uh, and how can we control this, and what are the mechanisms through which? You say that uh, we can control. I think it's a very involved <laughs> question. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I, I think please stay on the topic. Yeah, that's that's a. But let uh, let me tell you one thing: uh, the tides are one of the mechanism uh, for mixing in the ocean. Okay, so depending on how the tides change, the amount of mixing that occurs in the ocean uh, should change. Uh, sir, in this talk, we were discussing about Indian uh, physics of Indian summer monsoon. Mm -hmm. So you you have posted one question about the precipitation hole near east coast of Sri Lanka. So how it is relevant to us? Why Indian scientists we are, are caring for that question? Because since there is low precipitation in east coast of Sri Lanka, it is yeah. their problem. Why should we care that for? <laughs> well, it's an interesting problem. And it might give you it might give you insight on the working of the Indian Ocean uh, uh, of the uh, ITCC over the North Indian Ocean. That is what is of interest. Uh, even if you are uh, very focused on the question, we will do only things which we are helpful to us. Uh, your funding will go down, though. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have a less hilarious question from somebody? Yes, in the front, please. <coughs> How does the El Nino effect fit into the picture here? Okay. Uh, as you know, the original discovery of the El Nino uh, was in fact uh, linked to finding uh, uh, reasons why uh, 
monsoons fail over India. You know, Sir Walker was the head of India Med Department when he first uh, discovered this link between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean uh, and the Indian uh, monsoon. Uh, see, I, uh, what happens is, if you look at the global distribution, uh, you have a warm area in the Western Pacific. Okay? And that warm area breeds something similar to what happens in the Bay of Bengal. You know, that warm area is just to the east of Bay of Bengal. Okay? So it uh, has some impact on uh, what happens in the monsoon. I have focused more on the Bay of Bengal, just being parochial, but it is, uh, it, there is an influence which comes from the eastern parts. In the El Nino, that warm area shifts towards the east, and it gets decoupled from this whole uh, South Asia and the Indian summer monsoon region. That is how it impacts the, uh, the, the monsoons. Okay? So an El Nino is a phenomenon by which the warm seas, uh, the warm waters of the Western Pacific starts moving towards the east, and as they move towards the east, the precipitation center shifts towards the east. That way, it has an impact on the, uh, on the Indian monsoon. So the other question is, uh, basically, one has to realize that the monsoon is part of uh, a, a, a global uh, event because uh, it is linked to the IPCC and the development of the IPCC. So anything which happens on a very large scale, as, uh, as in case of the El Nino, we should be prepared to expect that something will happen to our system. That exactly was my continuation question, that okay. since it affects agriculture in India so much, yes. how well can we predict El Nino's effect on India's Well, monsters? El Nino's can be predicted, uh, well, uh, can be predicted uh, reasonably uh, well, uh, but the link between El Nino and the monsoons, uh, I think, is time dependent. Uh, you, sh you should talk to Solochana on, I mean, on I this. <laughs> no. I was going to say that whether is, that uh, is something Mr. which has he has spent more to add. Uh, a lot of time on. You know. Can you hand the mic to Ms. Gadgil? I'm just taking advantage of her presence here. Yeah. Do you have a, a comment to add? Yeah. Actually, if you talk of year-to-year -year variation of the monsoon, which has a large impact on agriculture, it does depend on El Nino. The dominant mode is El Nino, on which it depends. And these days, we can predict El Nino reasonably well. By we, I mean atmospheric scientists. The models are pretty good in predicting El Nino, and also the link between monsoon and El Nino. However, that's not the whole story, because there are two modes that are important to the monsoon. The second one is nearer home. It's on the equatorial Indian Ocean, OK? So the convection over the equatorial Indian Ocean also has an impact on the monsoon. In fact, if we could predict both of them, the two together can explain more than 50% of the variability, interannual variation. But we are yet not able to predict the equatorial Indian Ocean oscillation. And no model is getting the link correctly between that and the monsoon. So, but uh, I suspect that in the next decade, we, by uh, about 10 years, we should be much better off. And we should be able to predict at least a large part of the variability of the monsoon. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else? We'll take one last question from the back somewhere. The hand that stays up the most, the longest. So maybe a naive question, but this is about the, the, re the recent floods which were there in the Kerala coast. Oh, so it is due to some unprecedented rain. And uh, is it connected with its ITC's uh, zone or uh, some sudden changes in it? Or it's, is it a local phenomenon or something? Uh, Again, uh, I, I must remind you, I am a physical oceanographer, and I, sh I shouldn't give you expert comments on these sort of things. But Solochana has told me that there are people who uh, actually link uh, those floods to what happens across the equator. And uh, there are studies, right? 
there are uh, modelers who have been able to predict an intense event, not as intense at, as it occurred, but at least they're able to do it. And interestingly, it, be, it appears to be a somewhat different creature from the ITCD. The clouds are not so high. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, this is what we call a meso scale event, or a very small scale event. In fact, this year, Lakshadweep had large deficits of rain. And even this event that rained in Kerala didn't rain in Lakshadweep. So uh, it has nothing to do with the ITCD. It is another event that occurred because of the moisture coming from the Arabian Sea. And some meso scale system developed. And apparently, the detailed topography of that Kerala region played a very important role. That is why even in that event, you will see in some places it has rained plenty. But nearby, it has not rained as much. So it's a very complicated story, but it is not the good old ITCD. <laughs> I would like to emphasize that uh, the focus of my talk was to give you a large scale picture, uh, not particularly uh, uh, something that would help you to make a prediction about what will happen a few days <laughs> from now. <laughs> I think let's wind up and, and thank Professor Shetty for a wonderful <laughs> talk. Thank you. Another applause for Professor Gadgil for, for pitching in with some really wonderful insights. And thank you all for coming and making uh, this a wonderful event, our 30th uh, anniversary. Um, and over the two days, we've had a, a lovely set of uh, uh, events. Thank you for making it uh, wonderful. Thank you.